Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a review of an all-time classic masculine fragrance and it is actually on what is now going to be known going forward as Green Irish Tweed Day in the Fragcom. I have a feeling this is going to catch on like wildfire for those who are in the know. Uh, basically it is a tradition that's set by my brother from another mother across the pond, Rich Mitch. Uh, he basically wears Green Irish Tweed every March the 1st, okay? So March 1st for him is Green Irish Tweed Day, and I am going to stand in solidarity with him and not just wear it as my scent of the day, because that is what I'm doing, but also review it on the same day he has reviewed it. So this is a Fragcom first for, for us, where we have both reviewed the same fragrance on each of our channels on the same day, and it is March 1st, and it's a beautiful day here in Texas. Uh, it feels like a proper spring day to be wearing Green Irish Tweed. It was a little bit cool in the morning, probably in the 30s. Uh, and it's going to get all the way up to 71 degrees today. Perfect spring day for Green Irish Tweed. So March 1st from now on is National Green Irish Tweed Day. And, and that's what I'm going to put in the video title. If I did not put that though, you guys should know that this would be a vintage Hall of Fame review because I think this is one of the most influential fragrances. Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about how it came to be. We'll talk a little bit about the background of uh, Green Irish Tweed. But first, I want to talk about Creed itself. It's a house that gets a lot of flack nowadays. It's very, I would say, uh, popular to hate on the House of Creed because they have given a reason to hate on them ever since the Ghost Perfumer book came out and people kind of peeled back the curtain and saw what was going on. Very easy to hate on the House of Creed. However, I still like Creed. There are some Creed fragrances I absolutely love. There will be more reviews on individual reviews on the channel from the House of Creed. I still plan on reviewing things like Royal, Royal Oud, um, there's a bunch of them that are going to be coming uh, down the pike, but um, uh, Royal Oud, Viking, I mean, there's a ton of Creed fragrances that I've got lined up that I want to talk about on the on the channel, but I have reviewed some. I've got a Creed playlist that you can check out where I've, where I've talked about things like Aventus, Windsor, Slash Royal Mayfair, uh, Zesty Mandarin Pample Mousse, Royal English Leather, Pure White Cologne, Aesir Aluminum. So this is the seventh Creed review on my channel, and it is of Green Irish tweed. So here's the old school box. My bottles are 10 years old. And I feel like sometimes when I say stuff, um, people think I'm bullshitting or they, they think I'm full of shit. Um, so what I did, um, to much pain and suffering to the Ram, is I actually went and hunted down, not just the box, but the old bottle. So this is my current bottle. And I would probably guess, because it's hard to see through these, I would probably guess I'm, I've got about 80% of this bottle left. And I actually went through an entire bottle of Green Irish Tweed. Sometimes I don't have this um, type of knowledge of a scent, okay? Because sometimes when you have a huge collection, it is impossible to basically wear a full bottle. It's a rarity to wear a full bottle because you have so much, you're constantly wearing other things. But one thing I will show you is both of my bottles are 24. Here's the one that I ran through here. Just, I mean, it's basically completely gone, okay? Um, and I And this was full whenever I got it. So here is my original bottle, which was 14M01 for you batch code lovers out there. 14M01. Now, they went in alphabetical order with the with the um with the letters. So 14M01 came at the end of 2014, whereas 14A01, which is my bottle that I currently have right now, uh, if it can focus, and Creed is known for putting batch codes in different places. So you notice the one I showed you originally, the batch code was right here. This one, it is right here. That does not mean it's fake. Doesn't mean Creed puts them all over. It's tough. Some Aventus batch codes are here. Some are down here. I mean, I've got Creed batch codes where, like I said, they're here. This one's right here. Creed is just known for strange quality control stuff, okay? And look at the atomizer. So in the beginning of 2014, it was the old fire hose atomizer. Look at this atomizer. Let me just show you guys. I mean, it just absolutely dumps. I mean, dumps fragrance on you. It is my favorite atomizer of all time. I wish they brought these old fire hose atomizers back. Um, I mean, that is two sprays and I am absolutely drenched in green Irish tweed, right? Exactly how I like it. So they went to these atomizers. You can see the difference immediately. Um, still very good, but they weren't the fire hose. 
and now I think it's completely different. Uh, but um, but yes, yeah, so I have gone through an entire bottle. I, I dug this out, box and all, to show you. And of course, you know what I'm going to say about the box. I prefer the older box. Um, I really like these little Creed logos all over it. I think it's classy. Um, the Millicene, which I think they did away with, which basically means the best of that year's crops, which comes from, it's a term that's taken from the wine industry. This feels very, quote unquote, tweed-like. Um, it's felty, tweed uh, type material here. And so I really like these box. Sad they did away with them. And of course, with Creed, you get your little inserts and you know, all that good stuff, which I don't have to go through. If you've owned any Creed, you've seen, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. Um, so that is Green Irish Tweed. Let me put this back in its, in its packaging. And um, so yes, the original, my, my bottle that I ran through and now my current bottle that I'm using. So I have tons of experience with this fragrance is the reason I, I pulled all that out for you guys. So let's start at the beginning, which is a great place to start. And Green Irish Tweed, when you're discussing it, I feel like it is impossible to talk about without discussing the man who made it, Pierre Bourdon, okay? If you have not read The Ghost Perfumer, I would urge you to go read The Ghost Perfumer, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about understanding where he came from and where he wanted to go with Green Irish Tweed. First, I'm going to read you the blurb, so you have a generic understanding of what Creed says this scent is. It says that uh, Green Irish Tweed, according to Creed, is a green fougere aromatic and fresh fragrance. Man, that opening is stunning. Um, five star opening. I don't. I don't give ratings, but damn, that is a beautiful, just gorgeous opening. It says a classic gentleman's perfume, green Irish tweed. Uh, is a woody, fresh scent inspired by the lush green countryside estates and Creed's equestrian tailoring roots. Well, I guess Creed did start as like a tailoring house, so that is true. Inspired by Olivier Creed's family cotier legacy, Green Irish Tweed Eau de Parfum is a true fougere fragrance that is both aromatic and fresh, evoking the lush green countryside of the Emerald Isle. Freshly cut grass, definitely, and a fresh sea breeze, this classic men's fragrance is a clean and natural smelling scent characterized by its dry, grassy, hay-like dry down. Reflect refreshing head notes of lemon and verbena are perfectly cooled with a breath of invigorating peppermint. Layers of fresh green geranium are pitched against fresh and aromatic lavender, while rich notes of cedarwood, sandalwood, oak moss, and ambroxan mingle together to leave a unique, long-lasting, arboreal scent for him. A refreshing twist on a classic gentleman's fragrance. So, there you go. Um... And uh, that is the uh, blurb according to Creed's official website right now. So uh, first, let's talk, go back to Pierre Bourdon, who created this in 1985. And I think Pierre Bourdon is a certifiable genius. I've done a perfumer's portfolio review on Pierre Bourdon. Um, if you search his name in YouTube, you'll probably see it on my channel. Uh, but he is one of the only perfumers of all time that I can think of um, to create what I would consider to be the dirtiest animalic fragrance of all time, and one of the greatest fresh fragrances of all time for men in the same decade. Just an absolute monster. And if you don't know, that dirty animalic fragrance he created in 1981 was none other than YSL's Koros. This was when YSL was kind of sitting on top of their mountain. Uh, they have since now turned around, flown off of it, and then crashed back into the mountain, uh, is what YSL has done. But um, this is when they were one of the most important fragrance houses in the world, and um, their fall from grace has been epic, mighty. But um, uh, basically, Green Irish Tweed, of course, is the uh, fresh, one of the uh, best examples of a fresh masculine, one of the greatest fresh masculine fragrances of all time. And Koros is one of the most dirty animalic designers ever released. Um, and there are two completely different styles of fragrance. You know, some perfumers are known for creating like a specific style, right? Maybe they like using ambers or maybe they like using, um, you know, florals or whatever it is, right? Pierre Bourdon did what I would consider to be the incredible. And um, there's a quote from F. F. Scott Fitzgerald, which perfectly sums it up. He says, the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. So Pierre Bourdon, to me, when I say he's a genius, I really think from watching him, I'm no genius, but I think I can spot a genius pretty well. And I think he is a certifiable genius. There's no doubt about it. Listening to him, 
listening to the books he likes to read, listening to how he talks, just absolutely, if I was running a fragrance company, he would be who I would want as the face. Um, so, after creating Coros, Pierre Bourdon became obsessed with creating what he described in many interviews, you can probably find them on YouTube, of creating what he called a new kind of freshness, okay? And he was obsessed with making sure that it was different enough from what was seen as kind of the peak, the example of a fresh, the reigning king of fresh masculine fragrances, and that is none other than Dracar Noir. Okay, so this is going back to the early 80s with Pierre Wardney, another what I would consider all-time great perfumer. I have a review of one of his scents on the channel. Boss, number one, one of my all-time favorite honey scents of all time. Um, and just all-time favorite fragrances ever. I mean, we're talking about multiple top 10 fragrances in, in this one review here. But um, it is um, pretty telling that, you know, Pierre Bourdon, um, he wanted to, and this will definitely, by the way, get a Vintage Hall of Fame review on the channel. This will definitely get a Vintage Hall of Fame review on the channel, but they couldn't be opposite to each other, right? So in the early 80s, everyone thinks about the 80s as being this dirty, animalic, everyone had, thinks about things like Antaeus and Koros and Leonard Porom, and, and there is a part of that, right? Um, but the other side was a fresh uh, seed was already planted. So if you start smelling things like Oscar de la Renta Pour Louis, if you start smelling things like Dracar Noir, you're definitely getting the turn to fresher fragrances, even in the early 80s. Sometimes turning taste of an entire industry is like turning an aircraft carrier. You know, you don't just spin it around like you're, dri like you're driving a Mazda 3. You uh, have to slowly turn everything. And that's what was beginning to take root in the early 80s. And Pierre Bourdon stuck the flag in, in the pole, basically, in the pole. He stuck the flag in the ground um, and really planted the flag in 1985 with Green Irish Tweed. But um, he wanted to make sure that it was seen as different enough from the king of the then fresh fragrances, which was Dracar Noir, okay? Uh, he wanted to, it to be known that when his fresh fragrance became a hit, Green Irish Tweed, and then it eventually morphed into Cool Water, uh, which he was also the perfumer for, he wanted, you know, future folks, which is basically us, to look back and say that his freshness was distinct enough from Dracar Noir. Now, that is somebody who is very cognizant of what, his, what he is creating, okay? And so the most important part of the fragrance for Green Irish Tweed is the fresh feeling, okay? So that was what was so important to him, capturing what he described as a new kind of freshness, okay? Those are Pierre Bourdon's words. So when you smell Green Irish Tweed, especially in its vintage format, now, this is the old bottle. They don't make these um, four ounce bottles any longer. Creed has since shrunk the bottle sizes because of course they have. Um, and I obviously, this has become like a way of telling older versions, right? So when I, what I'm smelling is a vintage version. What I wore before, they were both actually from the same year, 2014, just pure happenstance, but that's just the way it worked out. Um, so what I'm smelling and what I know about Green Irish Tweed are from bottles from 10 years ago, okay? So um, that being said, when you smell Green Irish Tweed, especially in its vintage format, um, the freshness of the lemon verbena and the cut grass is something you're going to get instantly, okay? I mean, it's literally like if you're standing in a field and, and someone's mowing the lawn around you, there is a very distinct smell of grass when it's cut, right? There's definitely this cut grass, very fresh, and, you know, you're going to get lots of words like fresh and clean and aromatic because of the lavender thrown around because of green Irish tweed. It's impossible to describe the scent otherwise. And I used this example before in the movie Gladiator, where he is walking in a field of dry wheat, you know, whenever he's like dying, basically, at the end of the movie, he's going in and out of consciousness, and he's rubbing, he's, his hand is um, sort of um, touching the tall wheat field that he's walking in, and the wheat is golden and dry, and I've used that to describe sometimes different types of fragrances, but this time I want you to substitute that dry wheat looking note with a fresh green grass and flowers. Just imagine this perfect green countryside, okay? Uh, just imagine this picturesque Irish countryside, right? That is really the way to think about it. And just imagine maybe someone's coming along with a scythe and chopping down parts of it around you and you can just smell when it gets chopped that there is just a release of freshness that comes into the air. And that's literally what you smell like. I mean, you smell like 
cut grass and lemon verbena, which is somewhat sharp, but also very smooth. And there's something very purple smelling about green Irish tweed, extremely purple smelling. And basically I'm sure, well, I'm guessing, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that it is a mixture of iris and that violet creating this iron owns like effect. And some say that there's also violet leaf in here, which you will definitely get this ozonic element, okay? Uh, the violet leaf is totally different from the violet leaf you would experience in something like um, Fahrenheit, for example. But there is this ozonic freshness. They called it a fresh sea breeze. I don't know if I would go so far as calling this an aquatic. I know cool water is obviously described as an aquatic. Um, I actually owned a bottle of cool water when I was a little kid. I bought it on an airplane. Actually, my father bought it for me on an airplane when I was very young. Uh, when they used to sell stuff, I guess, duty-free style on the airplane. But... Um, you know, the ozonic freshness just seems to originate from other places, okay? So, um, the violet and the iris notes combine to give this powdery purple smell. So, imagine everything I described with this beautiful, um, royal powdery purple-like smell. And, um, when you mix it with the sparkling, uh, almost sharp, soapy aspects of the lemon verbena, very aromatic as well you're going to get this herbal garden, just pristine countryside freshness feel. That's the best way to describe it, okay? Uh, you and, and by the way, if you are the one person left on earth who has not smelled this DNA, and I would argue that even if you think you have not smelled this DNA, you have, okay? When someone's walked by you in a mall or a store, or you've smelled it on someone, you just didn't know it was green Irish tweed or cool water or uh, our moth train or whatever all oh, there's a million clones there's a million clones there's a million videos on youtube about this um i would argue that uh you know this fragrance is 38 years old basically right and i'm i can i can just imagine in in the 80s when you had to let's say go to france or something to get one of these from creed that there were wealthy wall street bankers walking around in the late 80s smelling of green irish tweed i mean it just it fits perfectly to be honest with you um but creed claims there's peppermint or this mint note which to be quite honest i don't know if i really get um it is you know listed as peppermint um and i i don't think it's a traditional peppermint smell like, you're not going to get peppermint hanging on Christmas trees. It's not that at all. Um, but it is a enhancer. I think the peppermint kind of works as an enhancer to keep that image that I tried to paint of fresh gardens and, you know, well-trimmed fields and Irish countrysides and all of this stuff uh, fresh and crisp in your mind. And, of course, in your nose. Um, I think peppermint may work as a little bit of an enhancer note, but you're not going to get peppermint. So if you don't like mint or anything like that, don't, don't even worry about that. Um, but it's interesting because it's a very ubiquitous claim in the industry for these brands to say that this was picked at the peak of freshness or this flower was picked at the peak of uh, sunrise so the oils kept naturally, you know, you're used to hearing those blurbs, right? Uh, but in Green Irish Tweed, the overall blend that Pierre Bourdon sort of created does make you feel like you're looking at a countryside just in full bloom, you know, um, like the Nirvana song, full in, in what is it, in bloom? Uh, but think, you know, everything is just perfectly in bloom when you're smelling this, which it's March 1st right now, so maybe the perfect time to wear this scent is like April 1st, actually. But uh, definitely there is this full bloom feeling where none of the flowers are withered, none of them are old. Um, everything is new and fresh. Everything is optimistic because it's a new season that you're looking forward to, right? And, um, it just feels like you're looking at a pristine landscape, okay? Like as if God created that landscape absolutely perfectly. There's not a, not a, um, leaf missing, not a petal missing on the flower. You know, not everything is perfect. All of the stems are nice and crisp. And maybe even, you know, there's a slight mist in the valley. And have you ever been, have you ever got, like, got lettuce or something and you left it in the fridge too long and the lettuce leaves start to feel like that soggy, they like start to wither and curl over around on themselves and you still eat it anyways because screw it. But really you're wishing you ate it a week ago before it sat in your fridge for a week or two. Uh, there's none of that in this image in my mind. It is a perfectly pristine landscape, okay? And that mist 
just feels like it's settling at the bottom of the valley or at the bottom of the ravine, okay? And But if you've ever been on like a hillside, a countryside, looking down at a, at a valley or ravine, you'll be able to notice that this mist is kind of settling in when you're standing up top. But when you actually walk down into it, you don't actually pay it, you know, when you're in the middle of it, it you don't pay so much attention to it, right? But it, it almost reminds me of when you're walking by the store and those misters turn on to mist the vegetables so that it looks like there's glistening water and that they're fresh and all that stuff, right? Um, and, and make them look as appealing as possible. This image of the countryside is as appealing as possible. And that's what makes this fragrance so attractive. So let's talk about the base because we've been talking about the top the whole time. So the base of this fragrance is basically made up of um, ambergris, cedarwood, oak moss, and sandalwood. Those four are what are listed from my understanding of the scent, okay, according to Parfumo. Um, and I remember old Creed advertisements where they would talk about the base of things like ambergris. Um, they would talk about sandalwood. And my bottle, like I said, is 10 years old. Okay, so um, I don't know if there have been changes to the modern formulation, but um, I also don't know if this bottle contained real ambergris even 10 years ago, or if it was already what the industry would describe as salty ambroxin, you know, a ambroxin note that was uh, amped up with the best type of synthetic materials to give off this ambergris-like feel, right? I don't know what the true, uh, the truth of that would be. And so, either way, uh, Creed's, whether it's Creed's take on salty uh, ambroxan or real ambergris, uh, Creed just did fresh fragrances like nobody else, in my opinion. And one of the biggest parts of the freshness is that ambergris note. And, and if you go to Creed's website right now, you may have noticed when I was reading the blurb, I read, not ambergris, but I read ambroxan. Um, and and um, so, I don't know if that is a... Um, change that they purposely made because I really remember Creed hyping Ambroxan on Green Irish Tweed from back in the day. My guess is that um, there was always some Ambroxan and Dihydromersinol or something in, in, in the note listing. Um, and remember, Pierre Bourdon with his two sort of competing ideas in his head, right? So he wanted to create a fragrance uh, that had a new type of freshness, but in order to do it, you have to use synthetics. You know, a lot of when, when people review, it always cracks me up when people review Green Irish Tweed on YouTube or they review, let's say, Cool Water, and they'll be like, oh, Cool Water is so synthetic, and but Green Irish Tweed, oh, it's so natural. There's nothing but just, you know, cre like Creed just took a funnel and just funneled fresh flowers and, you know, all of these, uh, these grassy notes in here. This is all fresh, natural ingredients. Bullshit. Uh, there are definitely synthetics in here, but the genius of Pierre Bourdon, remember, two competing ideas in his mind at the same time, is that he was able to create this natural, realistic smell that smells so natural using these unbelievable synthetics. Um, and so that is part of his genius, obviously, in my opinion. But um, I do think that uh, stuff like Dracar Noir and Green Irish Tweed from the 80s laid the groundwork for what came at the end of the 80s and the early 90s. So things like Aramis New West, things like Cool Water, uh, of course, Aqua de Joe in the 90s, which is when you were full blast, uh, the aquatic wave came and swept everything else away. Um, and, and so um, I think that, you know, these are trendsetter, trendsetting fragrances. That's why I said at the beginning of this video, this would be a uh, vintage Hall of Fame review. It, it probably should be, but uh, maybe I'll put it in the comments or something. But it is, you know, maybe I'll put it in the Vintage Hall of Fame type playlist because it, it deserves that type of attention. And I say all that to say this, that, um, you know, the, the new bottles, which by the way, the new bottles of Creed sell for $500, almost $500, $470 for 100 mils, which is primo territory, uh, $470 for 100 mils. And um, so with tax, you're probably over 500 bucks for 100 mils, which is crazy because this, I can't remember what I paid for this, but I think I paid about half of that for this. If I remember, I'll have to go back and check my records. But, uh, and I remember thinking, ugh, that is a lot. And it's the vintage now. So who knows what these vintage bottles go for nowadays. But um, it, 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 uh, I don't know if the same quality of ingredients is in the stuff that they're putting out now. Creed has been sold twice, okay, over the last couple years 
First, Olivier Creed and his family sold it to BlackRock, and then BlackRock waited a year or two and then just flipped it to Caring. I've done a video on my channel under the Creed playlist. You can check it out with the per with Caring, Caring purchasing Creed. Um, and if you notice, all of a sudden, the releases are amped up. They're releasing stuff like no other. That's because Caring is now taking control, and um, they are pumping stuff out. BlackRock, uh, I don't think they ever really knew how or wanted to run a fragrance company. They just wanted to make money. So they doubled their money or whatever they did, tripled their money, sold it to Caring, and, and it was a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. So um, basically, I don't know if the vent, if the new bottles have the same amazing combo between that smooth, ultra-attractive sandalwood in the base that Creed is so well known for, and combining with this fresh, top, spicy, green, cut grass freshness, right? Uh, that is so amazing in the bottles that I'm over here just drooling over. I don't know if the new stuff has the same um, quality. I haven't smelled it. I have no clue. Uh, but if anyone knows, leave it in the comments. So I should al also mention before I forget, before I say goodbye, is that this fragrance is so fresh. And in fact, Pierre Bourdon hit the mark right on the head with his creating a new form of freshness so well that sometimes Green Irish Tweed has a soapy feel to it, to my nose. So just imagine this soapy, ozonic, feel contrasted with the green. So there's this green galbanum note in the top, which doesn't smell like traditional galbanum. Like if you're thinking of the galbanum you're going to get in things like um, uh, French Lover by Frederick Mall or, you know, number 19 or something like that, this galbanum smells completely different to me. It, it's used in a way like I've really never smelled galbanum used, but there is a there's a galbanum feel and it, and it almost feels like it's supposed to be recreating maybe this rooty like so the plants I was mentioning imagine like you're also getting a little bit of the roots underneath but in a fresh and soapy type feel that's what again so even though I contrasted his animalic side to the fresh side there's also I think a contrast within this fragrance of let's say fresh uh fragrance notes at the top with maybe some of those rooty undertones and so even within, you could have this competing ideas that Pierre Bourdon is playing with. I think he's an absolute genius, pure out and out genius, brilliant, one of the greatest perfumers of all time. Um, and so uh, I'm sure also the iris adds to that rooty, maybe waxy like feel, per definitely the purple feel of the iris and the plants and, and the lush, fresh lavender uh, that's aromatic and um, the ambergris in the base, which is unbelievably you know, uh, mixed with that sandalwood. That ambergris sandalwood combination is really what Creed became known for. It became like a calling card. And um, part of me, of course, thinks that is credited to Pierre Bourdon. You know, Pierre Bourdon created so many of the Creed, the Hall of Fame Creed fragrances where ambergris and sandalwood come together in a way. Um, and, and, you know, instead of having Creed's crest on the front, it would be awesome to just have Pierre Bourdon's face right there on the front of their bottles. But um, this um, unbelievably smooth, creamy sandalwood. And so, so something I want to mention, too, before we say goodbye, is what, I forgot to mention this earlier, but what is an Irish tweed? I mean, a lot of people, I've said this before, a lot of people see the name, they read the name, they say the name, but they don't really know what it means. They don't take the time to look up what in the world is an Irish tweed because um, many people I think know if you're into fashion and stuff like that, but I think there's a large population that they just don't know what it is. So what is an Irish tweed? Well, so an Irish tweed is basically a men's jacket, okay? So it is a, a tailored, classy, uh, elegant, sophisticated looking men's jacket, okay? And tweed is, is named after the pattern that is actually stitched into the wool. So proper Irish tweed jackets are made out of wool. Although now I've seen somewhere they're not wool, but maybe they're using other more modern synthetic substitutes. I don't know. But in the old days, it was supposed to be wool. And I actually had Scottish Terriers. Um, they were dogs I had back in the day. They've since passed away a long time ago. Uh, not sad. They got to live their whole lives. Uh, they were brothers. They were fantastic dogs. In fact, I would definitely get Scotties again. They're brilliant dogs. And, um, but they had this coat where water would just like, you know, uh, they had this briny, how would you describe it? Almost like this wiry coat where water and mist and stuff would just like, you know, rough, fall off of their back. Um, 
And so I think in Scotland, in Ireland, where this was very popular, the wool was supposed to act as like a, you know, protector of the man wearing it from the weather, because the weather is shit there sometimes, right? And if you live in Ireland, you'll agree. You're a rose, leave a comment. So um, the Irish tweed was known as basically this pattern that they stitched into the wool. Uh, and it became synonymous with Ireland and Scotland, okay? So um, it's supposed to be weather-resistant and classy and elegant and all that good stuff I mentioned earlier, but apparently originally in the 1800s, tweed was worn by, like, the farmers and the working class first because they were farmers out, out in the fields. Um, and like I said, the weather was probably shit. And so um, then the upper class ended up adopting it after the farmers and the um, working class Irish and Scottish merchants began wearing it. And then the upper class adopted it. And what's interesting with Creed, it was kind of the opposite. So they created green Irish tweed uh, in the 80s. I, I imagine originally it was like the Wall Street bankers and stuff like that going to Paris and dropping $100 on a, on a bottle of this back then and telling their friends, dude, I spent $100 on a fragrance. And they were like, you spent $100 on a fragrance? And he's like, yeah, I know, right? Um, that, that was how I imagined things back in the 80s. And, and now, Creed has been, like, accepted by so many other people of society because it is now available. You can go to... Creed wasn't in Macy's or wherever the hell they are nowadays, all these different malls, Creed counters and stuff like that, um, and, and standing boutiques, and none of that existed back then. You had to, like, fly to, fly to France, basically, to get a Creed fragrance, I believe. Uh, and I don't think they shipped overseas. I think you had to go to the boutique, right? So it was only folks going to Paris that were coming back with stuff like this back in the in the 80s. Um, so, but I say all that to say that now this has been accepted. This is maybe one of the most popular masculine fragrance there is. This this DNA was maybe one of the most popular masculine styles. I mean, maybe one of the most recognizable. When you think about the fact that Pierre Bourdon used this as a springboard to then go create cool water. Um, it makes perfect sense, you know, when you think about how popular this is and how well-known and ubiquitous this is with masculine, clean, fresh, elegant men. Uh, and so probably I should have shaved for this review, but uh, you get the idea. So so that is kind of my take on Green Irish Tweed. I think it's a masterpiece. It's a vintage Hall of Fame review. It is long overdue. There's so many other creeds I want to talk about on the channel, like I, like I talked about earlier, um, there will be more Creed reviews to come. So for you Creed fanboys and girls out there, do not worry. Um, but this day is dedicated to the rare time in FragCom history where we are all standing with Rich Mitch, wearing green Irish tweed on March 1st, or if, you, if you're watching this later on, mark it for your calendar next year. Uh, March 1st is now officially green Irish tweed day. And so I think that is a fantastic way to kind of ring in the spring and uh, stand with my brother. So you have two awesome reviews. Hopefully awesome. Hopefully you guys appreciate this review. I love doing this kind of content for you guys. I know lists and top tens and all that stuff get the clicks, but I just don't care. I, I want to put out these type of detailed reviews. Um, and who knows, even if there's one thing different you heard or learned, or, or if you've never smelled it, if this review gets you to smell this fragrance, then I'll be a happy camper. So that is my take on Green Irish Tweed from the... Uh, from 1985 by the great Pierre Bourdon. If you have experience with Green Irish Tweed, do let me know. Leave it in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. I love the feedback. I uh, love the um, interaction with you guys. So happy Green Irish Tweed Day. Cheers, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.